Good morning, friends. <laughs> um, it's a little cold in here without you today. You get to watch us from the comfort of your home. And all I want to say is how lucky you are. <laughs> Um, I did make an announcement um, this before we began, letting um, those that were here in the church know that they're welcome to drive home if they want to watch from home, but some have decided to stay. So if you see me looking around and making awkward eye contact with the four or five people in here, that's what I'm doing. Um, friends, we find ourselves again in this situation. Um, I just want to encourage you in the name of the Lord and remind you that even in time of uncertainty, um, we have an anchor that is secure, which is Christ Jesus. So we have nothing to fear. Um, what we do is cling to the constant, which is God and his promises, in which he says that he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. And even when we can't understand what is happening, when this situation will end or what will happen, we can trust in God and his goodness. And I know that for a fact. So this morning we continue our sermon series on friendship. And as I reflected on the beautiful friendships that God has blessed me with, I was reminded of a friendship, and it's one of my favorites, and because of these, the series, um, I reached out to this friend again, uh, who was my neighbor um, in Alaska across the street from where I lived. So as I told you, I lived in a little island in southeast Alaska, and the church um, was on a street, Noceum Street, that had very few homes. And one of the homes, uh, there was a Hispanic, the only other Hispanic family um, that had ever lived there permanently, like moved there very early on. And I happened to be living across the street from them. And I would remember looking and praying and asking God, help me reach this family. And I didn't know how. And I've told you before, I love to people watch, love to do it in airports, love to do it at parks. Sometimes when I'm not busy, I just love to observe people. And as I had a lot of time uh, while living there on the island, I would turn off all the lights inside and those uh, lights in the church, the windows were such that you could look outwardly and they could not see you uh, if the lights were off. If the lights were on, they could see everything. So when those lights were off, I would just peek and I watched and I observed and I saw what time they'd come in and what, I wasn't stalking them. I was trying to get to know them without having to say anything first, you know. Um, I'm pretty outgoing, but, you know, a girl can have introvert moments, especially when she's in a new environment. And so as I was observing, I prayed and specifically asked God to bless me with their friendship and allow me to become their friend. And I've told you I got a little sick. And while I was sick, I made a plan of how I was going to introduce myself. And I went over, I introduced myself, shared some food with them, and that's what got me in through the doors. Let me tell you, an appreciation for food or having something in common is an easy way to make friends. I have made great friends with the Reed family. They love good food. In fact, sometimes when I make really good salsa, I'll text James and I'll say, James, I just made a bomb salsa and you need to try it. It is so good. And maybe like me, you have friends that you like to share things with. And so my way in to this friendship was through food. And I took a plate of food over, introduced myself. He said, let me uh, talk to my daughter and have her come. I think you should work out with her. I was a little offended, but then I was like, okay, whatever it takes the lengths that will go to pursue friendship. And so um, my friendship with my neighbor, who happened to be about 26 years my senior, and um, he had been widowed and had um, just suffered some loneliness, maybe some disappointments, and God allowed me through our friendship to encourage him um, and to bring a makeover 
which was fun. Cue the music and the scenes, makeover scenes where you try on a lot of clothes and you find the perfect outfit that most fun movies have, but not quite like that, but yes. And we had a beautiful friendship and still have. So because of my friendship, I got to experience beautiful things on the island with his family and with another young couple who were um, Adventist, who became Adventist, who were and had left and then came back. And this young woman who I met, young lady who I met on the island, who I became a good friend, friends with and mentored and got to spend time with, um, just reached out to me this week and let me know um, that she remembers our friendship and she is pregnant and about to have her third baby. And I was there for the whole process of the first baby. Um, and when I think of the treasures that I have, I felt like opened and unwrapped with friendship. I know that you are no different, that you've had your beautiful friendships, that there are people that you count so important and valuable in your life, people that have just made a massive difference. And the Bible has an example of a beautiful friendship that I'd like to call your attention to. But before I do that, I have a quote by C.S. Lewis that I thought um, really nails friendship. And so if we could have it on the screen, I'd like to read it with you or for you. Is it up? The C.S. Lewis quote. No, wait. Oh, here it is. It says, in friendship, we think we have chosen our peers. In reality, a few years difference in the dates of our births, a few more miles between certain houses, the choice of one university instead of another, the accident of a topic being raised or not raised at a first meeting, any of these chances might have kept us apart. But for a Christian, there are, strictly speaking, no chances. A secret master of ceremonies has been at work. Christ, who said to the disciples, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, can truly say to every group of Christian friends, Ye have not chosen one another, but I have chosen you for one another. The friendship is not a reward for our discriminating and good taste in finding one, an, one another out. It is the instrument by which God reveals to each of us the beauties of others. And I thought that was absolutely magnificent. That any one thing could have kept us from being friends or having the opportunity to have the friends that we have. And as I reflect on the beautiful friendships that I have had, I think, yes, any one thing could have gone differently and I wouldn't have met these beautiful people. So the unlikely friendship of a person in the Bible, two people, two friends that I'd like to draw your attention to this morning is David and Jonathan. So the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel um, that David was a shepherd and Jonathan was a prince. Jonathan had his own armor and David had a harp and a slingshot. Jonathan grew up in a palace and was trained in the art of war and David grew up in the little town of Bethlehem and he was trained to tend sheep. Can we say that opposites can be friends? Very much so. And so um, Jonathan was the oldest son and in line to inherit the throne. And we know that David was the last born son of eight. In fact, when Samuel goes, they didn't even bring David out because David was out there pasturing the sheep. So um, Jonathan was of the tribe of Benjamin and David from the tribe of Judah. But despite their differences, they were arguably the best friends the world has ever known. Uh, what I love about this story is that it is so unlikely. It is so unlikely that David and Jonathan would be friends, but yet we find their friendship. Jonathan, already a great man of war, um, likely met young David on the palace on the day 
uh, that David killed Goliath. Um, and I think of what that must have been like for David. Um, it's actually pretty gory, and the children's stories don't necessarily go into how gory that death was and the killing of Goliath was, but basically his head was like being dragged around, and it was actually bloody, and um, for those of us that don't necessarily like all of that, there's a lot of that in that story. And yet uh, Saul is taken by this young shepherd boy who just thinks he's amazing. We know that um, Saul has more than the winter blues, moments when he's quite sad, and he calls on David to play the harp and the lyre. And so we know that David then proves himself not only to be an amazing musician and composer, but also a great warrior, which made him, no surprise, very popular with the ladies. So much so that there was a song written about him and a song written comparing um, uh, just how many people he'd killed. I don't know that we necessarily have songs like that today, but we do know that the young ladies, and by ladies I mean like teenagers and late teens and maybe early 20s sure love a good heartthrob that knows how to compose a song. Um, Justin Bieber can attest to that and all of his millions of fans, as well as One Direction and all, those, all these boy bands. Um, but none of these boy bands or Justin Bieber or any of these guys have ever done what David did, which was also be a warrior and be brave like that. And so here, David um, meets Jonathan and something amazing happened with their friendship is that Jonathan first impressions of the young musician slash giant slayer warrior by day songwriter by night um, hero I could just imagine like the wind must have been blowing in his hair and he just all the girls must have been swooning um, and here another young warrior who has a third of Saul's army at his disposition who had already slayed 20 Philistines with his um with his assistant, I don't know what we want to call him, um, they meet. And it could have been like a fight of like who's better, but instead it was instant realization um, that, hey, we could be friends, we could be great friends. Like there wasn't that jealous. Uh, instead, what we saw is that um, Jonathan saw that there was something special, that there was an anointing over David. Uh, the Bible tells us that David had already been anointed before he slayed the giant. That means that Samuel had already gone and chosen him through God. God had told him that he was the one and had poured oil over him and had set him aside. And when you and I think of what it would be like to be king or queen, um, we don't necessarily think if we've been chosen that we should have to do grunt work. <laughs> I wouldn't think. I know that when Princess Diana, based on the Netflix, um, what is it, The Crown, um, when, she, when it was noted that she would become the princess, she had the palace, she was at the palace, she had all this attention and all these things and what to do, what not to do. Um, and David didn't have any of that. David was still out there shepherding sheep and looking after uh, his flock after he'd been set apart. And yet we have Jonathan who sees that there's something special about David. It's not just that he can write a song and slay a giant, but there's something in him. Something is different. You know, God saw the heart, and I think that Jonathan saw it as well. So there was an equal recognition that these two young men were something special. They were kindred spirits, equally impulsive, equally brave, equally convinced that God was behind Israel, and both leaders of, they were both strong leaders of men. And so we have this unlikely friendship between the both of them. Um, there were commonalities uh, between them that bonded them together. They came from different backgrounds, but they had a few things in common. They were both warriors. They were both men of faith who served the living God, and they were provided with God-given courage and strength. Um, and they decided to support each other. So they entered into a covenant friendship. Now, their covenant friendship wasn't much like ours. I know, I don't, 
<laughs> trying to think how many times I've sworn be best friends with someone forever and ever, and then I don't even know where they are. Like, Jonathan and David's friendship was not like that. So the Bible says in Samuel 18, verses 1 through 4, it says, And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Now, loved him as himself. You've probably heard echoes of that being repeated later on in the New Testament with a command that's been given by Jesus to us. But at the time, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 18, um, that Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and he gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword and bow and his belt. So in our terms, like what did best friends give each other? When I was growing up, you'd make like a best friend bracelet that you'd like, um, you know, braid together. You pick like some colors um, and it's like something you do like in summer camp, like you best friends forever. We've got matching bracelets. And then like the older you get, you might um, get like charm bracelets. I'm trying to think what people do, like best friends matching something. I know that some friends decide to get pregnant around the same time so they could be pregnant, like best friends pregnant together. Friends, they want to have their kids around the same ages so that they can play. So, I mean, they do these things. I've seen that some friends buy homes in the same neighborhood so they can have watch their kids grow up together. I mean, I don't know. But at that time, Jonathan made a pact and a covenant with David. And his way of doing that was by um, giving him all of these things. Uh, Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other. This is 1 Samuel 20, 42. With each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord is a witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Very similar very similar to a promise and a covenant that was done between two lady best friends, um, Naomi and Ruth. Now, if you're thinking, I'm going to put a pause on our David and Jonathan sermon. If you're thinking that Naomi and Ruth, that that was only a relationship of mother and mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, you're wrong because Orpah, we see through Orpah that she only kept that mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship, what was necessary, which was, okay, I've done everything that I have to do. Um, I will now do what you asked me to do, mother-in-law, and I will go and make my separate way. But we know that Ruth decides to go a step further and she does that amazing that passage that we see your God will be my God your people will be my people um, where you go I go type thing and here Jonathan is doing something very similar so we know a few other things from the book of first and second Samuel we know that David married Jonathan's sister um, Michael I think her name was um, and she was promised to David after he slayed the giant um, we also know that Jonathan ended up protecting David and saving his life that David was chosen by God and appointed to replace Saul as king and we do know that he kept and did everything that he could to keep him safe so some of the takeaways um, that we can learn from this story is that friendship is a gift from God, 100%. Like the quote that fr from C.S. Lewis, if you think that by chance you have the friends you have that you don't, and I promise you that if you make a map of your friendships, like friendships that you've had at different stages in your life, you will see how different friends have contributed to different parts of your journey in life. And God brings friends, and some friends are only here for seasons, some friends are forever and for life, but whatever they may be, God brings and uses relationships to lead and guide us. And this friendship is no different. So I love, and I wish that um, Jonathan and David grew old together and we had like this beautiful story of how like their kids played together and stuff, but that's not the case. 
But we do know that um, there are some lessons that we could learn. A true friend is true no matter what. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born uh, for a time of adversity. Jonathan had reasons to give up on David, but he didn't. He could have been jealous of David because David was anointed king, which meant that naturally Jonathan would never inherit the throne, but he wasn't. He did everything he could to save his brother. A true friend loves you as he loves himself. Twice we read that Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. And in the New Testament, we hear echoes of that in Matthew 22, verse 39. And this is one of the biggest lessons that I want to leave with you today. It is a true friend helps you find strength in God. So I told you about my neighbor who lived across the street. Um, aside from the fact that um, I helped him with a makeover and encouraged him to get on online dating and start meeting people his age and start exploring friendships and possibilities that he was interested in but never had the courage to do, one of the biggest things that I love about our friendship was that by the grace of God, we were able to share faith together. And I was able to encourage him to return back to church and to reestablish that connection with God that had been dormant for a while. So in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 16, if you have your Bibles, I'll have you turn with me. Um, there's this passage, and this is what it reads. It says, um, Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh, uh, and helped him find strength in God. So Jonathan knows that his dad, Saul, is pursuing David. And he knows that David is upset, like he's worried, doesn't know what's going to happen. And Jonathan goes and finds David, and he helps him find his strength in God. Isn't that the most beautiful thing about friendship? That sometimes friends are the ones that give us a call and encourage us and remind us God's promises. Sometimes we need a friend to just listen to what's happening and to tell us that everything's going to be okay. Sometimes we just need a friend who reminds us and points us in the direction of God. And this is what Jonathan did. And this is what Jonathan said. He says, don't be afraid. My father Saul will not lay hands on you. You will be king over Israel and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And then Jonathan went home, but David remained in Horesh. So again, this beautiful friendship leads to a strengthening in God and reminding him, hey, you've been anointed, you're going to be king, and I'm going to be right by your side second to you. That's the most beautiful thing about friendship, is knowing that we don't have to go through this journey alone, knowing that we have a friend, knowing that there's someone who's going to lift us up when we start feeling down, and when we look around us, yeah, there's reason. Sometimes you guys are stressed. Sometimes I'm stressed. And I shared that with you last Sabbath, that I have friends that I call that uplift me, that I laugh with, that I joke with, that make life better. There's this saying um, that I, this quote that I read on friendship. And at the beginning, I, I read it. And I'm like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this, but I'm going to share it with you. And it says, friendship is unnecessary like philosophy, like art. It has no survival value. Rather, it's one of those things which give value to survival. And I thought, yeah, definitely. Um, I love art and I have an appreciation for philosophy. Um, I can't imagine what the world would be without them. And as I reflect on friends, yeah, I can't imagine what my world would be without them. So you have the opportunity to support and to um, have friendships and also to um, encourage your friends and strengthen your friends in the Lord when they are traveling through difficult times, when they are encountering difficult moments, when there is uncertainty. We have the opportunity to strengthen people and to speak life into a difficult situation and to bring hope um, 
and to also bring companionship that says, listen, I may not have all the answers, but this is what I know to be true, that you're not alone and I'm right here and that God is with us too. So if you um, find yourself struggling at the moment, if you find yourself feeling lonely because it's not easy to be isolated, to be alone. Uh, for those of you who do not have family that are living single in a home, if I'm not mistaken, you're allowed to have one friend that um, can come and visit. And through technology, I wanna offer you my friendship whether it is through Zoom, through FaceTime, or through a phone call, or through a text message. Um, it's not much, but it's here for you if you'll take it. And for the rest of us, I want to encourage us to continue to reach out to one another, to strengthen each other in the Lord, to recognize the friendships that God has brought into our lives, and to allow our friends to be friends. I have a friend um, who you know, who um, in the beginning, when I'd say, let's go grab a cuppa, whatever, um, and any time that I wanted to pay for her cuppa, she'd never let me. Now, I know that we come from different cultures, and here everyone pays for their own everything, but in my culture, if I invite, it's my invite, I'm paying. Um, and it took a while for my friend to allow me to be her friend and to pay for her cuppa. But we've gotten to the point where my friend says, it's not easy for me, but because I know that this is important to you, I'll let you pay for my cuppa. And I want you to know that it may not be easy for some of you to accept your friend's help and encouragement, but let your friends be your friends. I also have friends who are accountabilities, and to that friend, I say thank you. And it's not easy for me to feel like I want accountability, but when I have a friend who is willing to do the work, I have to be willing to allow myself to be blessed by their friendship. And so I want to encourage you to bless others with your friendship, and two, to accept the friendship that's being offered to you. Um, friendship is a beautiful thing, and relationships are what make this life pleasurable and bearable. So I encourage you today to make friends, to have friends, to be a friend, but most importantly, to let God into your heart and bless you with these friendships. Um, and also know that you have a friend in God, and you can, if you are feeling lonely, reach out to those around you. Um, but most importantly, you can always talk to God. May God bless you and keep you as you reflect on the story of David and Jonathan and the many things that we can learn from it. I hope the one lesson that stands true is that you can, like Jonathan, strengthen your friend in the Lord today. May God bless you and keep you. And I want to end with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful people that you have brought into our lives. We thank you that they bless us. And some friends help us physically. Like they come and they do things for us, um, things that we cannot do for ourselves. We have other friends that are there for moral support. When we feel like we're failing, like when things are not as they should be, we have friends that come in and stand by our side, grab a hold of us and say, I'll walk this with you. We have other friends that are willing to lay aside anything in order to help, as we saw uh, Jonathan help David. We have other friends, Lord, that you've blessed us um, that are there to brighten our day and to bring smiles and laughter. We have other friends, Lord, um, that you've brought into our life that are far wiser than we'll ever be, who uh, share generously their wisdom um, and knowledge, and, and they care for us, Lord. And what a privilege it is to have those friends as well that are looking out for us. We have other friends that are willing to be honest and tell us truth. And as hard as that may be, it's so good to have friends that we know love us and are willing to share truth. Lord, allow us to be a friend to someone um, and allow us to be friended 
um, thank you for blessing us with beautiful friends. And as we reflect on this today, Lord, use us to strengthen one another and uplift each other in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.